Hello, I'm Pilgrim Beert of Device Pilot, and with me here today, I'm delighted to welcome Yiru Zhong, who's Senior Market Development Manager at Once, the telecoms company. Lovely to have you here, Yiru. Thank you, Pilgrim. So shall we just kick off? Uh, obviously, Once is providing connectivity to IoT companies, I guess, and so that goes beyond just smart energy. But can you just tell me how you personally sort of got involved in smart energy? What's your story to date? My story to date is, uh, to me, my uh, historical background has always been in the analyst world. And coming from a telecoms IoT analyst uh, at Frost & Sullivan, we were at a time with convergence of industries. So in my business practice, which was ICT, and we also had an energy utilities uh, research practice. And we said, maybe there is something to be had in developing a new uh, industry convergence research stream. And so I came in with our IT telecoms expertise to join with our energy practices. So they came with their, you know, all the generation uh, expertise, the transmission and, and traditional um, understanding of the grid. Um, and actually it was a time where indeed that was exactly the information gap in the market. So I've done this uh, for about 10, 12 years. And then as an analyst, I decided, you know, I think adoption of IoT is too slow. So I should try and instead of saying, this is what the market is, and this is going to grow fantastic exponential growth, um, I should just go out and achieve that growth itself myself. So I joined once um, and from our customers, uh, customers' conversations, the majority of our uh, customers are in the energy space. Uh, by that, we could say traditional uh, utilities companies with IoT metering, but also increasingly in the distributed energy resource space. So whether we are connecting um, our storage in, a, in our residential homes or in buildings and so on and so forth. So we do have quite a, a big base uh, around smart energy, clean uh, energy segment. Okay, really interesting. I hadn't realized it was that higher percentage. That's fascinating. So once first came to my attention a few years ago when I was at a trade show and I saw this banner outside your stand, which basically said, um, I think it was like 10 euros for life or something, um, uh, SIM card sort of fee or something. And I, and I thought, oh, that's a, that's a different model. I mean, obviously, historically, the way that these things have been charged is by the by the bite, you know, you usually pay for the SIM and then you pay for the, the connectivity. Um, I'm sure things have moved on a little bit since then. So could you just give us a, an update on, on what is ONCE's proposition to the market? Yep, sure. Um, ONCE is, uh, is an IoT connectivity provider, and we are very focused on just being the connectivity uh, provider, specifically looking at cellular connectivity. We are, as you say, we have a catchy uh, standard tariff, which was 10 euros for 10 years on a basis that it is meant to uh, include all the features that you need. So as you say, the SIM card is included, uh, the data uh, package that you might need in terms of transmitting uh, the data uh, for, from your devices, and also any of the hosting fees, roaming fees. I think the, the ethos of our organization is to make things very simple, very easy to understand. And so our background is really simplicity. We originally came in with a, a disruptive pricing model, but you know, since the launch of at once a, at the end of 2017, and then at uh, MWC 2018, I mean, the, the pricing model is, you know, picked up by, by our competitors. But really what we do is super focused on connectivity, making it easy for our business customers to either just buy and kind of just deploy, making, making it closer to reality about connectivity as a feature. Um, so we are definitely always looking to make things simpler uh, and not add any OPEX questions and, and so on. 
Okay, so you're saying your tariff is now, or, or the tariff that many customers are on, is a little bit more complex than just a fixed price for a fixed length of time. Or, I mean, what, what, what? How do you differentiate your tariff from um, your competitors today? Our our differentiation is the fact that everything you need to run an IoT is included. So we wouldn't have an extra, um, you know, kind of hosting fee or a one-off uh, one-off activation fee. For example, our SIM comes uh, pre-activated. So you, when you when you order it on an e-commerce platform, you get it shipped. It's automatically uh, shipped out. Uh, and if you're in Europe, you get it within three to five working days, and then you can start plugging it in and start using our portal. So everything uh, is included. And I think um, some of the some of the IT and customer journey. Uh, implications might sometimes be forgotten. So if imagine if if I as an individual and if I have to click multiple times, uh, I would already think, oh, this is more than three clicks, I give up. Um, and so we do put a lot of focus on smoothing out the, the journey that you will have, but also making it easy for our business customers to actually manage their, their estate. Because one of the things that I, I feel we, perhaps from an analyst background, we kind of think of things in a very clean way. We say that an enterprise will never have to deal with legacy systems. You know, they have all the budget in the world and this is what they can do, but actually there, there's conflict and, you know, you can't get rid of something, for example. So um, we really try to enable legacy integration into, into your, your systems or into future systems that you might have gotten off uh, uh, a Amazon uh, cloud vendor or something. Mm. Well, certainly when you mentioned the, the sort of provisioning part of the journey, I remember from my last company, it's, it could be quite a challenge if you're building up uh, stock in a warehouse somewhere of um, of, devi of devices. They may have out of date firmware. They may have SIMs oh, yeah. in them that need to be provisioned. And how do you keep track of who's got which SIM and uh, security? And people people take SIMs out sometimes and try and use them for other purposes. And uh, the the whole you know there's a whole host of challenges to do with kind of managing managing uh, SIMs as well as uh, sort of providing data. So I really understand that. Well, roughly, where is your business at at the moment? So you only started late 2017, 2018. Um, can you give me some size of the of the company today, rough number of customers yeah. or connections? Yep. Uh, we, so I kind of say we started, we founded at the end of 2017. Mm -hmm. We kind of announced to the world February 2018 at MWC. Um, and then I think... Uh, it was also a time of a lot of optimism about MBIOT. And so the expectations is that we're going to reach those millions of, of uh, connections easily. Um, so it has been it has been challenging and trying to pivot to to kind of say our offer isn't just focused on the low data rate applications, we actually also do um, telematics uh, use cases. Asset tracking is, is one of the most common applications, but we also do telematics. Um, so as, as of last year, we have uh, 10 million managed connectivity connections and we have 7,000 uh, customers. So right. I think this is, this, is very, this is very interesting because I remember uh, joining just a year ago, um, and we were we were at about six million connections. So I think that was uh, that was quite uh, good growth in terms of customers. Um, one of the things that we started as as any new startup is: Are you going to be around? If you say this is ten euros for ten years, are you going to be around in year three, year four? And and we are he still here. Um, we recently received uh, funding from SoftBank, uh, so we are we are quite good uh, in terms of prospects as well. Excellent. Yeah. Well, that's uh, quite a, quite an achievement. And and so you you just told me that um, more than half your use cases, I think, are around smart energy. So can you 
can you give me some just paint a bit more of a picture around that about who who what types of customers you have and what types of applications and yeah. even you know what what sort of data do they use and, and that kind of stuff just just paint a picture if you would of some of these uh, use cases yep um i think when you think of smart energy you kind of imagine them as our traditional utilities company so our you know national grid as our uh, tso or any of our uh, energy groups whether they run distributions and generation plants um, so of course as one of the key M2M IoT applications is metering. So we do have that as well. But what is more interesting for us is the, the wider adoption and awareness of distributed energy resources. So this could be the, the roof uh, panels that you put on, on your own, our own household roofs. But increasingly, you also get uh, um, buildings to start having panels uh, on, on their roofs, but also with energy storage. Um, I think in the UK, we are very much looking at the heat pumps market to kind of do connected heat pumps. And then also on another side related to distributed energy resources is also the electric vehicle um, space. I think that to me is Th these uh, applications or these sub-segments are really exciting because you now have newcomers who are digital players. So yes, you have your you know, um, EDFs, which is very traditional utilities, but then you have new guys coming in with their IT capabilities, digital, uh, uh, digital journey expertise to try and see what they can do. Um, our... Uh, PV, um, you know, the rooftop solar panels and, and so on. That is quite a, a hot segment because we are looking at ways to, to connect and take the data off. So, of course, if you are already in the house, you might say, oh, why don't I just use the Wi-Fi? And I think a lot of our customers are saying, yeah, we did try to see if we could use the Wi-Fi and get the customers to try and, you know, figure it out. But chances are it, it really has a lot of, burden on, on the support uh, team. And so they decided to go and try out with um, try out with uh, cellular. And I think for us, because it is actually very easy to test and our proposition really fits a lot of the small, medium-sized companies. So it makes it very easy to test. And I think one of our uh, differentiators I mentioned is, is our uh, digital expertise. It is that when you do try it, you, you do see that it is really easy to inter, integrate back in, into your own systems. Mm -hmm. So to me, that, that is really interesting. We still have to persuade uh, customers to say, oh, maybe don't use Wi-Fi. But one of the things I personally do not like to do is to say, oh, you must only use cellular or LoRa. You know, one uh, be behind just one technology because different uh, users for, for different uh, tools. No, um, absolutely. I sometimes think, um, you know, when my when I next have to change my wireless, uh, my Wi-Fi router at home, uh, it's going to be a nightmare. You know, it's not, it's not just the obvious consumer devices that you carry around, yeah. but it's all the embedded devices in your home um, that uh, you may have even forgotten about entirely that may be using that connection to keep their firmware updated or, you know, yeah, provide services absolutely. in various ways. And the idea that all of that has to be redone, um, uh, you know, if you change your Wi-Fi or whatever, is just uh, horrendous, really. So I can totally see why cellular gives vendors or autonomy in terms of connectivity and I've certainly seen that um, various friends of ours other companies um, who are serving for example social housing or yeah, other, was, other domains mm -hmm. where maybe the, the householder is not incredibly engaged with the service you're delivering yeah. um, uh, you know you want an independent thing you mentioned um, you mentioned Laura there we've just seen Sigfox one of the pioneers in uh, yeah. low power uh, wide area networking with a proprietary network um, go into receivership or file for administration um, unfortunately it's often the case that a lot of pioneers end up with the arrows in their backs. Um, but if we, if we do more generally about perhaps LoRa rather than Sigfox specifically, yeah. that's obviously a potential alternative that a company might consider as a way of getting relatively low data rate, relatively cheap backhaul for their 
for their application. Um, I mean, do you have any views about the sort of pros and cons of that? I mean, has, has once ever thought of getting into the, the sort of LoRa network game as well? When, well, when you say does once uh, consider getting into the LoRa game, I would say we, uh, we work on a collaborative way. So I wouldn't say, I mean, getting into the game sounds like we're going to also offer LoRa. Uh, no, we, we wouldn't um, because we are super focused on just the cellular. However, in, in, in understanding that there is room for alternative uh, technologies, uh, we, are, we, are not the, we don't have the power nor the desire to say cellular is the only way. So if you already have LoRa, um, most of our, some of our old customers have tested with our sims and, you know, when we started, but went for Laura, but now we are starting to hear back from them to say, hey guys, could you kind of see what you could do, as you say, kind of put into a, a, a gateway and then kind of just route uh, an aggregated number of uh, volume of data back. Okay, um, so, so you'd be back calling the yeah. you'd be back calling the gateway concentrator, yeah. but then Laura would be used as a local yeah. area network, effectively, yeah. or perhaps a very wide area, but not yeah. not sort of exactly. uh, national, or global. Yeah, that exactly. makes a lot of sense. So, so we, for us, yeah. we we would never say uh, do not do uh, alternative technologies, but we try to see uh, we try to see what we can do together. Um, so yes, in terms of getting in the game, we will be considering adding enabling on our connectivity platform to allow you to see your LoRa um, status. Okay. Uh, your yeah. LoRa to integrate into, because I think a lot, of, a lot of platforms now also allow you to do Sigfox, uh, allow you to see into Sigfox or, or other okay. technologies like satellite as well. So, so you can carry, sense. right, so at least you can carry some of the management or metadata that, yeah. that comes from the gateway exactly. through the connection. So you can understand, well, these devices are not connected, not because they've got a problem, but because the gateway has a problem, for example. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I so think, we see a lot of use cases like that at Device Pilot, where there are these kind of hierarchical yeah. connections, essentially, and you have to understand the topology in order to understand Correct. what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the things that maybe, maybe as an analyst or, you know, kind of, not really in the device side of things or deployment side of things. We do not really truly understand what you can see via the platform. And I think even having, uh, even having just a status that you can imply on what's happening actually gives you a lot of, a, a good starting point to diagnose what's happening. Um, very frequently, one of, uh, a few good examples in the past for us is our customer just comes on our on our support call and say, oh, our device is not working. Probably, uh, oh, it's not connecting. Why is it not connecting? And I think with, with a bit more uh, information that you can see on your platform, you can then kind of start taking out taking things out to kind of eliminate the, what, what the possibilities are. And yep. I think that will actually... I mean, even with enterprise looking at deployments of 10, 100 or 1,000, I think it, it, it just becomes essential to be able to root out all the um, irrelevant uh, events as well. Yeah, no, I think that that chimes very well with the kind of mindset we have at Device Pilot of, uh, you know, you will have some performance gap in, in mm -hmm. your service uh, for some of your devices some of the time, and you need to be able to analyze where that's coming from and 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 be able to understand, well, this much is coming at the device side, maybe mm -hmm. from hardware problems or software problems or whatever, but then a certain amount will come from the network layer as well for a whole variety of reasons, uh, and then maybe some application layer things as well. So, you know, the more more you can get a feed from those different layers, yeah. the more you can diagnose problems quickly and either immediately turn to once and say you've got a network problem yeah. or know that they don't have a network problem and actually it's a, it's a power outage or, or some yeah. other uh, problem and quickly diagnose the problem. It saves everyone's time and uh, allows you to uh, support the customer with a better service much more efficiently. Absolutely. So yeah, fascinating. And, and actually I was thinking when you were talking there how I think when people select technologies for communication, they they often get quite focused on the the specifics of the technology. You know, sort of how many bits per second can we get? Yeah. Um, how much coverage is there? All that kind of stuff. 
but actually it's almost the the whole operator thing you know the the, the service provision the sort of guarantee that, that you will make it work as it were is is such a big part of the proposition because there is so much you know these things are being deployed into the real world radio is complicated that yeah. there's so much that can go wrong which can really damage the customer experience and i think um you know that's a big part of what you're paying for not just not just bytes or whatever Absolutely. So, 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 once has been around for about five years now, something like that. Yes. Okay, and you're still growing cool. very fast. So, do you have any kind of lessons that you've learned on that on that five year journey? Really, um, you know, ways that the world has changed, ways that people are asking for different things. Um, you know, sort of best practice use cases that you've you've kind of learnt um, that your customers have taught you perhaps the hard way about how you you know how to go about. Um, doing cellular, particularly maybe relatively low bandwidth sort of IoT cellular for smart energy really well. Any any kind of general lessons? I think the first thing that pops to my mind really comes down, I think you were talking about um, when someone chooses a technology to get into all the technology metrics as you know, the speed uh, and, and data volume and so on. But I think a lot of times, um, we have customers and, and we learned this over time is the TCO or the return on investment calculation really becomes quite important. It's not just the cost of components, it is the cost of doing you know, all your testing and getting it out in your first iteration, but also operating and maintaining it. And I think uh, one of the reasons why I, I, I found your device pilot quite uh, resonates with me is precisely what are we, what, what is the objective of this uh, object or of this uh, new product? It is about delivering a service. And so it's not just, oh, I have my charge point out there. Thank you very much. We're going to make all the money, but it is about, as you say, uh, a lot of times, whether that device, uh, whether that charger is available. Um, and, and and so on, the, the level of details that you can get. So I think it, it is about thinking uh, of not just the components, the products, but also maintaining and operating that device as you scale. I think 10, I can play around manually, um, but if you get a SIM that is not connected and you have to go and find in hundreds or thousands or you know even more, uh, that really becomes quite difficult. So to me, um, the consideration is, is think about not just the starting cost, but also the OPEX, uh, for mm. example, and, and not just in cost, in, in effort level, um, in, in being able to draw um, alerts and, and automate uh, many of the things that you get out of your devices. It's not about creating stupid, busy work, but actually useful things that I can do with. Yeah, sort of actionable information. I yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so any thoughts about sort of, you know, if you look at the amounts of data that your customers are using or how they're making use of data, presumably in some level they are paying you for data. So, yeah. you know, they want to minimize that, make it efficient. Um, power consumption, I don't know how many of your customers presumably most smart energy things are actually connected to the mains but some aren't or have uh, ancillary sensors that are battery powered often things like temperature um so yeah any any kind of learnings there in terms of yeah maybe the slightly more technical stuff about um making good use of of data or, or battery power or whatever so uh, some of our customers when we kind of first you know first introduction i think it, it would be interesting to kind of say, okay, well, someone comes to our, our portal and say, I found this Google, I found this a very attractive, um, but maybe I don't, I think 500 megabytes is not enough. Uh, and then they, you start thinking, you start asking kind of, what are you connecting? Why are you connecting something? And then you kind of realize people's expectations are a bit different. And most of the time they say, oh yeah, I actually don't know how much uh, I would be expecting to, 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 to transmit. Um, and then you would be saying, why would you need a temperature measuring, uh, reporting back every 15 minutes when 
when all you need to do is, okay, I need to set it at 20, 20 degrees, anything above, I get it. So I would imagine that if it's, you start receiving some of these, th this is just an easy example. Um, but what I wanted to say is we do have, we do have customers who kind of imagine wildly different uh, data volumes. And, and we frequently go back to say, I think, you know, six gig for um, agri sensor is insane. Um, so we, we kind of kind of try to understand what, what they're trying to do and actually say from, from our experience, uh, something is not right in terms of um, why it's consuming so much uh, volume. Yeah, so that's a nice piece of uh, added value you bring, I suppose, is your experience of the use cases and how they typically behave and, and so on. Yeah, that, and helping people plan um, and budget. Yeah. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. One of the one of the interesting things that we have frequently found is also related to whether it's low data rate, so an LP, NP, NBLT, or actually the volume, um, and and that relates to uh, power consumption. I think mm. we are saying, you know, the reason why NB uh, or LTM is in kind of kind of pushed in the market is precisely to meet all the low power applications requirements um, and then 2G is not optimized for those things but I think it does come down to uh, the choice of connectivity really thinking about what you're trying to to get around your power consumption because there are a variety of ways that you can trigger your power consumption uh, feature. So if we are on the NBLT networks or LTM networks, you can you can say that the operators will have opened up their power consumption capabilities, but you could also be uh, be clever about the way your device itself is consuming power. It can be whether in terms of the, the design, but also how often you are triggering, you're sending data mm. and what for. Um, and so to us, it is about it is about knowing what it is that you can play with. And actually in combination, you might be able to get to get to a, a good uh, power optimized uh, state. And I think, I mean, one of the things that my friends who are not in IoT is saying, oh, you guys just talk so much about all these nitty gritty details. It really does not matter, but it, it unfortunately does. And so, you know, we, we could go on about power, consum uh, power optimization ways, um, but I think it is about thinking what we're trying to achieve in the end and then see what, we, what levers we can use to, to get there. Yeah, I think as consumers, we're a bit spoilt because we have this unlimited, unneeded bandwidth in our homes and often on our cellular contracts now for our smartphones and so on. And uh, yeah, therefore, we don't really differentiate between something that could take one byte and something that could take a gigabyte, you know, like a phone we download or, or video or something. And um, yeah, uh, I think, I mean, as with energy, uh, you know, being frugal, the ability to be frugal can unlock a whole load of new use cases and make things that weren't cost effective, cost effective, and, and ultimately, um, the way to be wealthy, I think, is to to make good use of a, a, as little as possible. You know, so um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, just before we move on, I mean, any other thoughts about lessons learned on on the journey that once has been on over the last five years, in a general sense? I would say that it was a good thing for us to actually position ourselves on on in the cloud. I think. Uh, this really accelerates our ability to push out new features. Um, and when I say new features, it is, it is about um, enabling the digital journey for our customers, um, making sure that we are able to use um, our AWS infrastructure to support. Um, so the device authentication, for example, that, is, that was very uh, a no, no brainer to, to start first. Um, for us, I think in order to, uh, in terms of speed to market, in terms of agility, I think it was good for us to already be aligned uh, with, with AWS for, for being in the cloud. I think 
when you consider an enterprise and they are consuming IoT, I think they still come from an IT background as opposed to um, someone in charge of phone lines and, and wireline and so on. Yeah, so no, I think that, got, that is quite important. Yeah, definitely. See, it feels like there's a new generation of, uh, of telecoms provider that, that was sort of born cloud cloud native and yeah. they have a totally different attitude to yeah. ag agility and making data available on APIs and, and yeah. so on. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Okay, well, finally, um, can I just end off by asking you about, uh, you know, just to, to get your crystal ball out and think a little bit about the future, not, not the very far future, but maybe just to sort of 2025 or so. So maybe the next, uh, I suppose that's the next three years um, inclusive. Um, you know, what's happening, what's happening in, in your world that people should know about and thinking ahead about what kind of technology shifts or market shifts or whatever might might be important to think about? Because I think often you know, people are deploying things that will have to live in the field for quite a long time. So it's quite important to think ahead. Absolutely. I think um, the first, the, the top thing for us is the fact that 3G and 2G and 3G are about to be uh, shut down. Um, I think in Europe, 3G is the one that is most likely to be shut down first before 2G. Um, and I think by 2025, we will see a lot of uh, the European operators shutting down, but actually not just in, 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 just in Europe, it, it is a global, uh, a global trend. And this makes it important when we, when companies are thinking of what technology to go to, um, or, or to pick and put into the device, they do need to consider uh, the possibility of having to switch. So when I say having to switch, you, sh you would say, oh, well, you know, if I've done this, I expect my supplier to support me. But inevitably, there will be, it is dealing with humans, dealing with project management, which inevitably timelines slip. Um, so it, it, it is just uh, an unnecessary thing to do if you know that by 2025, quite a number of uh, operator networks will be, will be shut down. Just, just um, off the top of your head, I mean, thinking even further ahead, just for a moment, what, um, you know, if you deploy something that uses 4G, sort of NB, NBIoT or, or whatever else, I mean, how long do you think it's reasonable to expect that to exist before you have to migrate away from that? I would say... If, if it's already on NBIOT or, or 4G, I think it's not that long. I think with, with 2G, and I think we already heard about the US shutting down 2G and a lot of the MVNOs are picking up uh, the, the demand or taking over the, the contracts for, for MNOs who are shutting down 2G. I think that took like two years. Don't quote me on that, but I, I remember that it being a difficult migration, difficult negotiation, uh, and and so on. Um, I think one of the one of the delays that you don't really want is to physically having that the risk is having to physically go out and swap out something. Yes, well, I was going to ask about that, actually, whether, you know, yes, the standards may change, but if you can upgrade your modem or, or your SIM, maybe maybe you can survive it. So, um, but I think we all see in the consumer world, don't we, that our laptops yeah. and our phones and everything have to upgrade themselves all the time, not just to fix bugs and add features, but just to stay current in, in terms of the standards that they're talking to um, locally and, and on the cloud and so on. So, you know, yes, sort of upgrading is not an option. Uh, it's a necessity, I suppose. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I think with in terms of the choices of low power, I think officially they are all within 5G. Um, yeah. Um, so actually, I should say in all seriousness, I think, the, for example, for us with uh, SNM VNO, we actually tell people that we are 5G ready. So if you do already have NB, um, we will be responsible for making sure you are you are able to continue your 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 devices mm. um, in the field. Yeah. I think what what the what the what the considerations are is really back down to the, the cost of the device, but also the the the, co the co cost 
of managing and operating over the lifespan of the device. Um, and I think actually, um, as we say, all the firmware updates, it, it, it can get, it, in terms of implementation, it can get where your firmware is too big and the downloads don't really do sm go smoothly. And it, it, it just takes a device out, which, which is yeah. well, not really lasts, the case. Nothing lasts forever, does it? I mean, I think in the smart meter world, it, they sort of think 10 years is the ideal thing, don't they? I mean, the, the battery for the gas meter will only last 10 years. Um, I guess no one will be using gas at all before too long. But um, uh, yeah, so I mean, eventually you just have to say this hardware is out of date. Um, uh, yeah, we've got to swap it out. Any other thoughts to 2025? Uh, I believe that we the, the momentum we are seeing in terms of distributed energy resources um, currently it's still very fragmented. Um, I would like to see kind of um, capabilities to manage not just your traditional uh, sensors for physical doors, but also lighting and, and air conditioning ventilation but also including your PVs and your EVs and so on. I think the, from what I can see, everyone seems to say I can do everything, but I'm just not sure how easy it is. And then also having um, kind of a, a capability to normalize these data in order to count your um, carbon footprint or in energy efficiency metrics, for example. I think when we, our customers are very much about instrumenting yet for, for now, but then I would like to see how, you know, these, these buildings are using the data, not just to manage and operate the buildings, but also to do the reporting towards um, the, the net zero initiative and so on and so forth. Mm. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it, how people often, all these early players often end up, they have to build everything themselves, they don't really interoperate with anyone else, there's no one to interoperate with in the early days, but then this, this sudden threshold happens in the market where suddenly people stop buying you if you can't be open because they need you to work with other people in order yeah, to, to build your energy dashboard or you know op optimize your heating with your whether your windows are open or whatever it is, um, and uh, that, those transitions can happen quite quickly. Uh, yeah, fascinating. Any other thoughts to 2025? Uh, I want to say that connectivity is going to be, I mean, it is already happening now, but um, I think more and more connectivity will be offered as a feature that is already uh, as part of part of the, the product mm -hmm. um, or the service. Um, and, and I really think those who can specialize in making that a reality is 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 the way I think maybe from a telecoms analyst background there is always a tendency that the world revolves around telecoms that really isn't the case except for um, telecom companies thinking that way so I think that will uh, the connectivity as a feature will will really continue to take off um, we just have to see how how that pans out. Well, that's a Lots great of note. people will come to try. Yeah, I think that's a great note to end on. I think, um, yeah, trying to be more customer centric and less thinking about monetizing the pipe yeah. or, or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Lovely. Well, you it's been a this has been a half hour sort of treatise in uh, in what's going on in, in uh, telecoms in, in uh, smart energy. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts with us. It's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you to, for inviting me. A great pleasure.